So at 4 p.m. Uh, and the next focus team will meet at 5. Uh, those will be in the, in the parlor back there. Um, please note the, uh, please see the note from uh, Jennifer Steele on the back and Mary Kennington uh, on the back uh, thanking the church during their difficult time. Um, I put a sign-up sheet out there on the table on the 26th of November, that's Saturday, at 10, we'll meet here and decorate the sanctuary for Advent, and uh, the 27th will be our hanging of the green service. Um, I put a sign-up sheet because the uh, Crafty Disciples Life Group will be here that day also uh, meeting and doing their thing down in the fellowship hall. And they've, uh, they have said that they would like to serve lunch to uh, everyone who's decorating the church. So we need to kind of know how many people would be there. So there is a sign-up sheet if you're planning on helping us. It'd be good to have you put your name down so we know how many to expect for lunch that day. Uh, also, don't forget that on the 20th of November, which is two weeks from today, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we will have our joint uh, community uh, Thanksgiving service with Congregation Beth Israel, and we will uh, we will worship this year uh, at the uh, at their uh, facility. Institute. Well, what time is that? five o'clock on that Sunday, the twentieth. Okay. Any other announcements? All right. Well, let's set our hearts on worship now as we open with a prayer. Let us let us pray. God, we are here for you um, because you are always there for us. Lord, we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Messiah, the one who has given us eternity uh, through his great uh, sacrifice on the cross, uh, giving his life and taking away our sins. Father, let, let this be a time of love, your love showering down on us and our love being lifted up to you through our worship today, through the songs we sing, the prayers we offer, just the time together, and of course, the, the, the time we share, the sacrament we share at this table today. Lord, we lift up Jesus' name as we worship now. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together and turn in our hymnals to page 374, Standing on the Promises, and let's go ahead and sing all four verses of this hymn.
you are sta- as you are standing, let us recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Our scripture this morning is Exodus 3, 1 through 6. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great side and see why the bush was not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said no further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Will our ushers please come forward for our uh, morning offering?
God, on this day in which we come to share at your table, we also share through the giving of our offering. Lord, it is because we love you. We bring it to you so that you might use it to do a great work in this community and through this church. Lord, please take it now. We offer it in love, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Do you have prayer requests this morning? Um, Lorraine has, uh, and Olin have offered this prayer request that uh, their daughter Beth uh, believes, uh, they believe that the doctors believe she might have had another stroke and will be having an MRI on the 14th. Uh, so uh, please pray for Beth that, uh, that she gets a good uh, result from that and that God would, uh, would heal her and help her uh, in this time. Anyone else? Yeah, Randy. Okay. Okay. So Susan is in the hospital again with a uh, with an infection, a UTI, and uh, <clears throat> it's one. This, would you say three times in the last several months that she's gone through this so so we want to lift Susan up um, uh, in this time okay okay, okay Jessica works with uh, with a lady named Audrey and Audrey's father passed away this week so we'll be in prayer for that family um, we would pray, uh, I would add, that I, I want to ask God to, to just place his hands on our election that's coming up this, uh, this week and uh, pray that everyone will exercise the, the freedom that God has given us to, to vote, but that God's hand is on our country and, and ask you to pray. You know, we should be praying for our country, not just at these times, I mean, when an election comes up, but, but in all times. And not just pray for our country, but pray for... Um, forgiveness, um, honestly, for some of the things that have happened in our country and the ways that we push God uh, away from us. And so I would ask that you lift up our nation in prayer. Um, also on this Sunday, we, we would take just a moment to uh, recognize uh, All Saints Day was, uh, was last uh, uh, Tuesday, and uh, we would recognize those that we've lost uh, in our own families. Uh, we also recognize those that have passed on from our congregation this year, Ronnie Vaughn, uh, Debbie Mason, and uh, uh, Carlisle Steele. So please be in prayer for, for those families. Any other requests today? Well, as God's people, we're called to, to pray for one another and to pray for others. And just to lift up our prayers to God, have a conversation with God. So we join together now to, uh, to do that together. We are here, O oh God, to worship. We are here to find your presence. We are here to pour out our hearts to you, 
out of need. But above all, Father, I pray that we are here out of our love for you. So often we move out of what we think is some kind of obligation. But Lord, we come to you in worship, not out of a kind of obligation, even though you tell us that we are to worship you. But Lord, we do that out of love. You are the creator of love. You are the creator of relationship. You are relationship. You are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you show us by your very example how love guides our life and how it is to lead our relationship with you. Father, let us pour out from our hearts how we feel about you and let us gather in the Holy Spirit and the power that comes by the Holy Spirit's residing within us as we have faith that Holy Spirit comes and we are strengthened and we are, we are growing and we are being made, made uh, more and more in the image of Jesus finding a kind of righteousness that we could never have on our own we seek that today. Lord, as we come together and as we, as we fellowship through this church and with the believers around the world, Lord, we, um, we seek to know how it is that we're to live. We have questions. Your Word instructs us, the Holy, the Holy Bible, it instructs us along with the Holy Spirit. But yet, Lord, we still... We still have many things that we don't understand. Today, we seek a greater understanding as we stay close to you, as we lift up the name of Jesus, as we sing these beautiful hymns, as we hear your beautiful word, as we share the beautiful smiles and handshakes and hugs of the body of Christ. God, let us grow in love. And let us see your majesty, almighty God, the one true God in heaven who has created all that we know and perhaps things that we don't yet know. But Father, you are our guide, our light, and our sovereign Lord. We lift up your name today as we pray. And Father, we pray for these that we've lifted up today. We pray for uh, Susan Turner. Pray for healing, Lord, for this infection that she's fighting. And protect her from any future infections. Lord, we pray for Audra's family over the death that they've, they've endured. Almighty God, we pray for this nation. Lord, in so many ways so many ways we have let the voice of Jesus be pushed far away far away from our conduct of the conduct of our daily lives and living Lord let there be revival let there be renewal Father we pray that your hand is on everyone in America as they go to vote this this uh, now even in this week Lord let us uh, let us have leadership that is of your choosing and your desire. And uh, Lord, may we all join together to seek you and to find you. Let the church find its voice, O oh Lord. And let us uh, fight with the leaders of our country for the freedom, justice, and especially the faith in Christ that we share and that you've so richly blessed us with. And Lord, we take just a moment to think of those that, that have gone before us in faith, family members that we've lost, ancestors that have established your church, established a, a tradition of faith in our families that we have taken on individually through our faith in Christ. We lift up today those that have gone before us in the year past, Ronnie Vaughn, uh, Debbie Mason and Carlisle Steele. 
Lord, uh, we pray that these servants of yours, these saints, are now with all of the other saints that have gone before us. And we thank you for their love and their um, witness in our lives. God, we bring these things to you in the name of Jesus. We offer ourselves to you through our faith and service to Jesus Christ. And join together now, we pray, as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Oh God in heaven, now as your word comes to us, Lord, I pray that it would that it would flow through me and into each and every heart here. Lord, use me today as it is your good will and your desire. Um, illuminate us all through the Holy Spirit and not through not through simply the words that come from my mouth, but let them be the words that come from your very heart. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, Almighty God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> For many, and especially the religious leaders of his day, the teachings of Jesus were earth-shaking. They were totally against the conventional ways of thinking of God, and more importantly, against the way that people chose to worship God. Jesus shook their world in his time, and he spoke in ways which seemed to overturn that way of faith that they were practicing. Sometimes we point to those people those that might have opposed Jesus as bad examples of faith, but we have to do that carefully because Jesus does the same thing to us. He shakes our world. He overturns it if we truly follow him. Our story today is a story of Jesus' encounter with some people who had their world shaken, who came to Jesus not really seeking perhaps knowledge, but one wonders seeking a way to discredit Jesus. And we'll see what it teaches us about how we approach Jesus and how we might ask ourselves, are we seeking to discredit Jesus or are we seeking to accept his teaching as he provides it? We're reading, I'm reading from Luke chapter 20 and it's verse 27 through 38. It's a, an interesting and curious passage to many of us because it relates to a subject or it seems to relate to a subject that, that is so close to us and it's marriage. Jesus talks about marriage. The Sadducees talk about marriage. But we'll see that it's really about far more than that. So this is God's Word. Let's hear it. Luke 20, 27 through 38. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and so in the same way all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. 
Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Luke 20, if we, if we read that entire chapter, is really a collection of story, stories about people trying to intellectually spar with Jesus. In the story we just heard, these Sadducees um, are challenging Jesus. And they use a kind of unique argument, kind of a made-up scenario in which this woman has lost seven husbands throughout her life. And they ask what's really almost like a riddle. Whose wife will this woman be? But really, their argument isn't about marriage. Their argument is about eternal life with God and their ultimate fate as people who believe in God. So who are these Sadducees? The Sadducees we read of often in the New Testament. Um, we often read of the Sadducees uh, in connected connection with the Pharisees. But those two groups of religious leaders, faith leaders if you will, really opposed one another in in many different ways. The Sadducees were a group of people, a group of very devout Jews, who only believed what was written in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. If it wasn't in the first five books in that ancient word, then they discounted it and they lived their lives in that way. Luke said that they did not believe in the resurrection, which is correct. And the reason that they didn't believe in the resurrection is because they tried to point to those first five books and say, show us where in those first five books it says there's a resurrection. What they don't tell us is that these Sadducees were a well-to-do people in the community and how that might be connected to their beliefs in God. It kind of makes sense, really, if you think about it. When all you have and the most important thing to you is what the world has to offer, why would you bother with something beyond that? When you can claim that being rich is a sign of God's favor and a blessing on your life, then why not go go all in on that? They had a sense of eternity, but it was in their legacy and in their children. Your name survives, that's what you were working for. We might see some of ourselves in those Sadducees if we look deeply enough, seeing our rich blessings as a sign of God's favor, which it is. But do we live for it? Do we live for those blessings or do we live for God? The Sadducees refused to go beyond that Torah. They denied the immortality of the soul and resurrection after death. They were obsessed with only that ancient written word and opposed the living word, Jesus Christ, who was right in front of them. We have to remember that perhaps the greatest merit in the law for our lives is it points out the perfection of God. It's a perfection that we on our own can never attain. But God in His infinite wisdom and love gave us the means through the cross to achieve that holiness and righteousness and perfection that we would never see on our own. The law shows us not only the perfection of God, but the love of God. Because even though we can't meet the law, we can't meet His standard, He forgave us. Not only did He forgive us, but He made a great sacrifice to do it and took all of our sins upon Himself. God desires for us to be holy as He is holy to the point that He's willing to give Himself to make that happen. 
the questions and the issues that these Sadducees are bringing up are important. And sometimes we get bogged down. They're important because they do instruct us in obedient living. By one measure or one understanding, we might say, well, they wanted to know about marriage and what that really meant. Especially as we had these rules that Moses gave them for how to take care of this widow. Sometimes we get bogged down in the little minute details and we lose the big picture of loving God and loving one another. Living the outcome of faith and living the outcome of what Jesus did for us. We find that a little bit, or actually a good bit, in the Revelation study, that the book of Revelation Bible study that we're in the midst of, filled with so much symbolism and so much <clears throat> that seems... Uh, seems maybe bizarre, seems strange, seems un understandable. But if we look beyond those details sometimes, we see the ultimate overpowering message of victory that's in that book. And these Sadducees were concerned about trapping Jesus about tripping him up that they didn't see the gift of salvation that he was bringing. Sometimes we want to make heaven like earth. That's what's going on here. These Sadducees are saying, here's what we do on earth in this situation. So how does that get reconciled in heaven? Not a bad question to ask. But sometimes rather than trying to impose our earthly ways on heaven, we should be trying more and more to bring the heavenly ways of Jesus Christ down to earth so that we're changing the lives, changing people's lives, living as Christ did and living in repentance and love and faith. These Sadducees are really concerned. They want affirmation of their idea of resurrection. That it doesn't exist. That there is no resurrection. But note that the way they do it, I told you that these are kind of wealthy people and a lot of the average Joe in the story did not think much of the Sadducees because they, because of their wealth and status, kind of lifted themselves up above other people. In this story, they talk about this woman, but they don't talk about her as a person. They think about the woman as an object to be used. They didn't worry about her grief. They didn't worry about the repeated pain that she suffered. Perhaps the anxiety that she felt from never having any children. They weren't worried about the woman they were using this woman. To her, she was just a, to her to them, she was just a piece of property. Whose wife will the woman be, they said. In other words, who will she belong to? Rather than seeing that she was a human being with feelings and emotions and that she was empty. They weren't worried that through all of those marriages. Who did that woman love? Marriage was not their real concern and they exploited the notion of this woman to try to gain something for themselves. To reveal, and it revealed their own spirits of arrogance and self-righteousness. But Jesus' response is kind of interesting. Having responded to their, to their sarcasm, he does something else that he often does in those questions, in those conversations. He answers the question that they should have asked. Resurrection from the dead. And Jesus tells them in a way that they could understand. He says, you only believe in the first five books of Scripture he said, here's a story that I want to tell you from one of those books that proves that there's a resurrection, that 
that Moses was told by God that he believes and is the God of Moses' father, of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said that's where we first started talking about resurrection. Had they set aside their snark and their disdain long enough to ask and to listen, he might have had a different way of explaining it to them. But Jesus did what Jesus often does for us. In fact, I might say what he almost always does. He wanted to meet them on their own ground. Jesus saw his mission as planting seeds. That's why he used the images he did to describe the kingdom. A seed takes a while to grow. An idea takes a while to set up residence in the conscience of a believer. Did he change these people's minds with that little altercation? We really don't know. But maybe a seed was planted and maybe a mind was opened to a new way of seeing the world and seeing the creator of all that is. Or maybe this was just a puzzle within a puzzle. This group came to Jesus with a riddle, a test to check his orthodoxy as they defined it. And Jesus riddled them right back. Maybe there's a lesson there for us that we're to meet folks where they are, speak their language, and then let the Spirit do, their work, do His work. After all, we've got an eternity to work with. They were ultimately worried about what happens when you die, I suppose. It's a question a lot of us have. What happens when you die? But Jesus reminded them, and he tells us, death has no hold on you. Death has no hold on you. 1 Corinthians 15, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Look, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, perishable, and we will all be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability. This mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and the mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? At the end of the story, Jesus says, I am not the God of the dead. I am the God of the living. Those who accept Christ, have eternity with Him. God sent Jesus to die for the living. As we live, we should look with the eyes of God at the people around us. Help them find their path to eternal life through Jesus and meet them where they are and help them find Jesus in their world. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. Amen. We come together today to join in uh, a meal at God's table, to join in communion. It is God's table. It's not our table. It's not a Methodist table. It is the table of all who seek Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll join me now as we celebrate this holy sacrament, as we 
remember Jesus' words before, on the night before he was given up on the cross. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. Father Almighty, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You are the God of Abraham and Sarah, of Joshua and Deborah, of Ruth and David, of the priests and the prophets. You are the God of Mary and Joseph, of the apostles and the martyrs. You are the God of our mothers and our fathers. You are God of our children of all gener- to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, almighty God, and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given up for you. Do this, he says, in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He drank from the cup and he told his disciples, he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many so that sins might be forgiven. He said, do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Almighty God, pour out your Spirit on those of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Lord, today we ask that you would renew our communion with all of your saints, and especially those whom we name before you now, Ronnie Vaughn, Debbie Mason, and Carlisle Steele. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So I invite you all to come down. I will offer the bread. We have uh, juice here that you can take. Uh, Also, if you are so inclined, we have the individual elements, the sealed cups with the wafer in a basket here if you choose to to, uh, have communion in that way today. Please come.
In closing, let's go ahead and stand together and open our hymnals to page 702. Sing with all the saints in glory. And you may not be too familiar with this one, but I think you're going to recognize the melody as soon as it starts. God, as we leave this place today, let us, in fact, carry Jesus Christ with us wherever we go. Let us know that we have eternal life, and we are resurrected through our great Savior, Jesus. His blood shed on the cross has saved us. We accept Him and live for Him today. Amen.